Welcome to Pavinars, webinars for the payment community. My name is Andrew Bram, and today we're going to talk about the differences between Portland cement concrete and asphalt concrete, and this is a 2024 update. First of all, thank you very much. This was originally recorded and held on August 2nd, 2011, and it was the very first Pavinar that I ever performed. It was then posted on YouTube September 10th, 2018, and it now has over 1,000 views. Therefore, an update is warranted. So what we'll talk about today is we're gonna start with the background, which is important terms and the purposes of a pavement. We'll then talk about material properties, the pavement components and type of pavements. We'll talk about mix design, materials and mechanisms, and then we'll talk about fuel performance, construction, and then finally distresses and maintenance. And this is intended to be a very broad overview of these topics. And actually most of the topics, I have a complete webinar on just one of these components. So please do sort through the webinars to see if there's something more that you want to learn more about. So there are many different terms used in industry. Let's start with the Portland cement concrete. You may hear the term rigid pavement, you may hear PCC or white top, and you may also hear cement. I always adamantly correct people when they call rigid pavement cement because as you will learn, cement is a component of Portland cement concrete. On the other side, asphalt concrete, you got flexible pavement. People say hot mix asphalt or warm mix asphalt, HMA or WMA just simply asphalt or asphalt mixture, AC, blacktop, and if you head over to Europe, they call it bitumen. Now, for the purposes of this presentation, we'll use the term rigid pavement for Portland cement concrete and flexible pavement for asphalt concrete. Now, regardless of the type of pavement, all pavements must provide a safe traveling surface. In addition to the safe traveling surface, they must be smooth, water must be able to drain off of them, and there should be surface friction between the pavement surface and the tires. Finally, you also need to have a structural capacity for the loads being applied. So whether it's a WB67 semi-truck like you see here on the right, or just a regular passenger car, the road structure needs to have the capacity to hold the loads it is designed for. And as I mentioned, these are important for both flexible and rigid pavements. Now we're thinking about a pavement structure. Usually there's some sort of surface layer or surface layers. These are anywhere actually from two inches to 12 inches, but on the heavier volume roads, it's up to six inches to 12 inches. And for rigid pavements, this is typically one lift, which we'll talk about a little more. And for flexible pavements, we often have multiple lifts. Now you see lift is in parentheses because you usually don't call a rigid pavement surface a lift, but you do certainly call flexible pavement surface lifts. You then have a base course. This is uh, unbound aggregate. So engineered crushed unbound aggregate. A sub-base course is usually some sort of modification of the in-place soil. And then the subgrade soil itself is the in-place soil. Now, the thicknesses and the material design of all of these layers depends on the application, the loads that will be applied, what your local materials are, the history of the pavement, and also your environment. So you may have one or more of these, you may have all of them, but there are varying different thicknesses you can use, and these are the five different things that dictate those thicknesses. And I do want to emphasize the importance of local materials. At the end of the day, there's quite a bit we can do about the application, the loads, the pavement history, and actually even the environment. But at the end of the day, really hauling local materials drives a significant amount of the cost. So local material availability is key. Now that's a brief background. Now let's move on to the material properties. So surface layers, that's what we're really interested in in this presentation, because both flexible and rigid pavements have a rock, which is an aggregate, and some sort of binding agent. And traditionally, the rigid binding agent is Portland cement, 
hence Portland cement concrete, and hence cement being a component of rigid pavements. And then the flexible binding agent is asphalt binder. Now that's not quite the whole story though. So traditionally, according to ASTM C150, Portland cement is the cementitious material that holds the aggregate together uh, in rigid pavements. Now actually a little more accurately, the aggregates float in the Portland cement matrix. However, there are other supplementary cementitious materials, according to ASTM C1697, that can be used to replace Portland cement. You can use natural posit lines, which are volcanic aggregates, clays, and shales, fly ash, which comes from coal power, slag cement, which comes from iron producing, and then silica fume, which comes from electric arc furnaces. Now even more recent are blended hydraulic cements, which is ASTM C595, and you can see there's four types there, which is basically a combination of Portland cement and Pozzolan, which is type 1P, Portland cement and blast furnace slag, which is type 1S, and Portland limestone cement, which is 1L, and then you can combine three of the ones that are listed above. Now the blended hydraulic cements is a relatively fast moving area, especially in the area of adding limestone dust to your rigid pavements. So this is something that I definitely encourage you to keep an eye out for and, and kind of keep on top of. Now for flexible pavements, our traditional Ashto M320 is simply asphalt binder unmodified performance grade or PG. Now you can also add polymers, but when you add polymers, Sometimes some of the tests in Ashto M320 don't quite work as they should. So we have Ashto M322, which is the multiple stress creep recovery or MSCR. This includes the J sub NR variable. This filled some of the gaps of M320. Now we can also have other additives such as reclaimed binder, and this is represented by the reclaimed binder ratio. And this ten generally includes reclaimed asphalt pavement, or wrap, and or recycled asphalt shingles, or RAS. A lot of agencies put recycled tire rubber into their flexible pavement, and that can help with the binding properties. Waste plastic is a, a popular topic now in 2024. And then also bio waste and bio binders are only becoming more important as we move forward. So the recycled materials and the bio binders are really a fast moving area. So anything under that other additives category, all of those are of high interest and I would not be surprised in the next six to 12 months if a new material is listed under this other additives list. Now let's talk about the different types of rigid pavements. Let's first start with words. JPCP is jointed plain concrete pavement. This has no reinforcing steels and the contraction joints control cracking. Compare that to JRCP, which is jointed reinforced concrete pavements. And this is where the contraction joints and reinforcing steel control cracking, usually in the form of rebar or tie bars. CRCP is continuous reinforced concrete pavement. This has no contraction joints and the cracking is held together by continuously reinforcing steel. And actually, CRCP pavements are designed to crack very, very, very small cracks, very, very frequent, uh, less than six inches apart, but they are actually designed to crack. We also have roller compacted concrete, and then finally, PCP, pre-stressed pre concrete pavement. And pre-stressed concrete pavement's not as common, and kind of a subcategory of this is precast concrete pavement itself. So those are all kind of in the uh, section five there of types of rigid pavements. <clears throat> and as I mentioned, usually in a pavement structure, you have six to 12 inches of rigid pavement, sometimes even more, sometimes a little less. You can get down to about three to four inches, especially with roller compacted concrete. Um, and then the base and the sub base is optional and four to 12 inches of one or both of those. Now, I always like pictures. I don't know about everyone else, but I always like pictures. So let's take a look at some pictures. You have your JPCP, 
and these have the transverse joints without dowels. And JRCP has transverse joints with dowels, and you can also maybe have a wire fabric in there. CRCP has that continuous reinforcement with no joints, and then PCP has those wire strands embedded in those precast um, panels. And these are all from the textbook Huang out of 1993. That is pavement analysis and design. Definitely an oldie, but definitely a goodie. Wow, that's uh, 31 years old now. It's actually pretty, no, 20, 21 years old. That's pretty incredible. No, 31, 31 years old. Man, anyway, uh, sorry, I just glanced over at my, my bookshelf and I thought about when I bought that book and wow, 31 years, okay. Sorry, side note. Uh, but moving on with the pictures, also we have roller compacted concrete, and this is a special type of mix that you place down, and you actually need to have rollers out there in order to compact it. Now, what about flexible pavements? We have conventional flexible pavements, and this is a, a whole bunch of series of different flexible materials. Starting at the top, you can have a seal coat. You then go down and have surface courses, tack coats, binder courses, and prime coat. You have your granular unbound material, which is your base course. You have your in-place modified soil, which is your sub-base course. And you have your subgrade, which is your compacted and natural material. And this is all, you can use all or parts of these for your conventional flexible pavement. You then have your full depth flexible pavement, which has your flexible materials again, seal coat, surface course, tack coat, binder and base course, prime coat, but you can see that there is no granular unbound material and no in-place modified soil. You just have your subgrade, which is compacted and natural. So you go immediately from your flexible materials to the subgrade materials. Then you also have a concept called perpetual pavements. I encourage you to take a look at some of Dave Tim's work from the University of Auburn. And he has a lot of material on that. And actually that also, that might be Auburn University. Oh man, he'd get so mad if he heard me say that. But Dave Tim from Auburn University, he works with perpetual pavements. Uh, this is a high quality surface layer. You then look at the layers below there very strategically. You want a rut resistant intermediate layer and then fatigue resistant lower layers. And again, you have um, six to 12 inches of flexible pavement that can get down to two on local roads, but these are generally placed in two to four inch lifts and then you have four to 12 inches of base and or sub base, and those are optional. So going back to Huang, 31 years, haha. Uh, the conventional pavement structure, you can see here going from the top down, you can have a seal coat. You have your surface courses, your binder courses, and your base course. Uh, you can see those are held together by either tack coats or prime coats. You have your sub base course, your compacted subgrade, and all that's sitting on top of your natural subgrade. So you can have any really combination of these. For full depth pavements, you simply have your asphalt surface and your asphalt based, and that is placed on the prepared subgrade. Now again, pavement lifts are usually no longer than four inches thick. So especially if you take a look at that full depth, you usually have two lifts of asphalt surface. You need a tack coat between those. And then uh, for 20 inch thick asphalt base, you would have a minimum of four lifts, excuse me, a minimum of five lifts at four inches thick, and those would all need to have tack coats between them as well. And then for perpetual pavements, kind of heading from the top down, you can see the top is a high quality HMA, SMA, or OGFC. That's a stone matrix asphalt or open graded friction course. And that's anywhere from one and a half to three inches thick. You then have your high modulus rut resistance HMA, four to seven inches thick, and that's where the zone of high compression is. You don't want that ruddy. Then at the bottom, you have three to four inches of a fatigue resistance HMA, and that's where you have your maximal tensile strains, the indirect tensile strains on the bottom there. So you wanna have fatigue resistance. So it's kind of similar in some ways to conventional. You have these various layers of various thicknesses, and they're all asphalt materials, but in perpetual pavements, they're very strategically designed to uh, control the primary distress in that area. So very interesting concept. I, I'm really a big fan. So in, in summary, the types of pavements for rigid pavements, you usually have one surface course lift. 
and it's placed either on a subgrade or a base course. It's often reinforced with steel and you often need contraction joints. For flexible pavements, you usually have multiple lifts. This is so you can achieve density during construction. You need tack coats to bond those lifts together, and you generally need a base course between the surface layers and the subgrade. Now, regardless of the pavement type, whether it's rigid or flexible, they both provide a safe traveling surface. You both want them to be smooth, to be able to drain water and to provide surface friction, and they need to have structural capacity to hold the loads that are being applied. So now, how do we determine the type and quantity of materials for the mix design? So let's move on from the material properties and pivot over to the mix design. So there are eight general steps to rigid pavement mix design. So as I mentioned, there's another whole pavement are available for rigid pavement mix design. So these eight steps are very general. There's al other alternate mix designs as well, and you can modify these eight steps, but these, this is just very high level basics. So first you choose your slump, and it's typically one to three inches for pavements. And slump controls the ease of mixing, placing, compacting, and finishing. You then choose your maximum aggregate size, and this is generally one third the size of your slab depth, and you want to make sure you have three quarters of distance minimum between cl of clear space between reinforcing bars. And the whole point of both of these is that you don't want an aggregate dominating a load transfer. Remember, aggregates in concrete, they kind of float in the cementitious material matrix. They don't actually hold the load. So you don't want a whole bunch of aggregate on aggregate contact or aggregate on reinforcing bar content. Hence all of these one third, three quarters rules to make sure that you don't have aggregates filling spaces and either touching each other or touching the steel directly. You then determine your mixing water and air content selection. This is dependent on a whole host of factors, including aggregate size and gradation, the particle shape, the temperatures, how much entrained air you want, and whether you have chemical admixtures, and if you have chemical admixtures, what type of chemical admixtures you have. Four, you determine your water cement ratio, and this is typically 0.4 to 0.5 for pavements, and this is based on how much strength and what type of durability you're looking for. And uh, to take a little break here in the eight steps, we're halfway through. If you want to learn more about all of this, I encourage you to obtain the American Concrete Institute, or ACI, 211.1. This goes into all of the details for these eight steps. So these are the first four steps. Then number five is the cement content. This is calculated from the water content and the water cement ratio, or some agencies require a specified minimum cement content. Number six is to determine your coarse aggregate content. And this is empirically based on your workability and it's also dependent on the aggregate size. You then do your fine aggregate content. And uh, basically, once you have everything else, you then just dump fine aggregate in, so all of your other components are found, and you simply replace all the remaining volume with your fine aggregate content. Then you make any necessary adjustments for aggregate moisture. The water is very, very critical in rigid pavements because that is what causes the cementitious material to hydrate and gain strength. So having enough water and the amount of water you're expecting is of utmost importance. You don't want to use dry aggregates because the aggregate moisture really affects the aggregate and the water quantity of your mix. Now overall, this is a volumetric mix design method. Now I, I briefly mentioned the importance of, of water and with hydration. Let's take a little bit closer look into that. So how do rigid pavements gain strength? Well, a gel forms at the surface of the cement and the volume of the cement grain decreases. So you can see here on the top, those cement grains are actually decreasing as that gel forms at the surface. And you have an initial set with a weak skeleton between those gel-induced cement particles. Then as time goes on, the final set occurs as the skeleton becomes rigid, and the specimens between the grains are filled with hydration products. So this is kind of the four steps that are used for the cementitious material, whether it's Portland cement or another material, 
to gain strength over time. Now, for those of you who know me, I graduated from the University of Wisconsin with my bachelor's and master's. I grew up in Madison, Wisconsin, so I absolutely love the Badgers. Now, I was very excited when I got one of the alumni magazines talking about a, a former professor of mine, Dr. Stephen Kramer, and in the summer of 2023, he and his group tested 100-year-old concrete at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. So in 1923, a very forward-linking professor cast hundreds of concrete cylinders, and they have been tested over the past 100 years. And Dr. Kramer tested the final set of cylinders in the summer of 2023. And a big part of this is the theory that Portland cement concrete continues to gain strength over time. And the hypothesis is because of this strength gain due to the hydration of the cement. There's a theory that that actually continues forever. That the cement never fully hydrates. And so this study at the University of Wisconsin set out to try and, and track that. And Dr. Kramer said that he would put together a publication looking at that 100 year study. So please uh, keep your eye out for that if that's of interest to you. Now, a flexible pavement mix design is only four steps and we're gonna cover the super paved mix design procedure. This is where you first select your asphalt binder and your aggregates. Again, this is based on local availability that goes back to the local availability of materials, the environment you'll be building in and the traffic that the road will be holding. You then select your design aggregate structure. So this is your aggregate gradation. Usually you take anywhere between four to seven different aggregates. You blend them together. Using the aggregate properties, you can estimate the asphalt binder content. You then consider your volumetric properties. This includes VTM, which is the voids in total mix. This is synonymous with air voids. The VMA is the voids mineral aggregate, and VFA is voids filled with asphalt. You compact the specimens at a range of asphalt contents, so it's usually plus or minus 0.5% of that estimated asphalt binder content, and then it's usually either plus or minus 1.0, so usually four total. And the number of gyrations is based on your expected traffic. You then determine the bulk density, the voids, the VMA, and the VFA. And this is all from Asphalt Institute SP2, which is a fantastic resource for all things asphalt pavement mix design. Now the third step is the selection of the design asphalt content. This is based on the optimal VTM and allowable VMA and VFA. And then you prepare specimens at the construction voids with the optimal asphalt content. And then you evaluate the moisture, sens moisture sensitivity. And this is testing both moisture condition and dry cement specimens and in indirect tensile strength tests. You take the ratio to compute the tensile strength ratio. This is uh, basically just looking at the impact of moisture conditioning on your mix. And it must pass some state specifications. Now, like rigid pavements, this is also a volumetric mix design method. Now, getting a little deeper into the optimal asphalt binder content determination, you find your optimal asphalt content at 4% air voids. So air voids and VTM again are synonymous. So you can see looking at this graph on the Y axis, you have 4.0. You simply draw a horizontal arrow till you hit your line, then you drop down and that's your asphalt content. And then using the VMA and the VFA graphs, you start on the X axis, the asphalt content, you go up and then you simply go to the left to calculate the VMA and VFA. And then, as I mentioned, it's also important to take into account the compaction characteristics. Now, my background is in asphalt materials, so I'm, I'm somewhat biased toward asphalt materials. I also have a much deeper understanding. So actually, I redid the HMA mix design pavement R in 2021, and um, that's a very nice in-depth dive into all things mix design. Again, this pavement R for both rigid and flexible pavements, very high level. Both of them have a more in-depth mixed design pavement R, uh, but the rigid pavement uh, mixed design pavement R has not made it to a thousand views, so I haven't redone that one, but the HMA mixed design has, so this one's been updated in 2021. 
So in summary, for rigid pavements, the mix design is based on the ease of mixing, your slab depth, and your strength needs. The order of components, you first start with water, you then do air, next cement, then coarse aggregate, and finally fine aggregate. Strength gain takes seven to 28 days, so there's various test parameters based on either seven day strength or 28 day strength, or you can mimic uh, Dr. Kramer and wait 100 years to test your mix design, but you'd probably have trouble staying in business if you did that. And then uh, the chemical reaction, the hydration of the cement is very, very important. And for flexible pavements, it's based on aggregate structure and volumetrics. You want to optimize the asphalt binder content. That's because the asphalt binder is by far the most expensive component of flexible pavements. You need to evaluate the moisture sensitivity, and then you need to heat the asphalt binder to coat the aggregate. So we now know the components and how to mix them, but then what happens in the field? And that's what we're going to wrap up with in this pavement R is kind of the field overviews of rigid and flexible pavements. So for rigid pavement new construction, you first need to prepare the site. That means preparing the grade, that's the, the, the natural in-place soil. You need to either establish a string line. We now have GPS and total stations as well. There's a whole rabbit trail I could go down to into the construction of concrete, especially with maintaining that um, cross section and cross slope. Used to be string lines, there's new technologies, the GPS and the total stations that is is now being used as well. Then you want to put your dowel, bar, dowel baskets down, put your dowel bars in there and you have, if you have that reinforcement. Uh, slip form paving, this is by far the most common, especially for mainline paving. You deliver the material, you place it, you spread it, and then you uh, set the header joints and the tire tie bars. And what happens here is then that material goes out through the back and you're actually building your concrete slab. And you can see that picture on the right. That's a, that's a thick concrete slab right there. That's probably an airport application. Maybe an interstate, but probably an airport if I had to put money on it. Uh, once that materials come out of the back of the paver, you finish it, you can texture it, it needs to cure, and depending on the temperatures, you may need to insulate it too. Temperatures and moisture content, you may, or uh, ambient moisture content, you need, may need to insulate it as well. Now, you also put joints in, especially for that jointed uh, reinforced concrete pavement. That means you actually make a saw joint, and um, so you design it to crack at that point where the dowels are. You then clean your joint, and then you seal your joint. Now, if you want to learn more about this, I encourage you to take a look at the National Concrete Pavement Technology Center, their Concrete Pavement Construction Basics. This is an excellent document that goes into far more detail than I did just on this one slide. Now for flexible pavements, uh, beginning is very similar to rigid. You first prepare the site, that's preparing the grade and establishing the elevation. If you have a base course, you then place that base course. And then for paving, you deliver the mix to the job site. Uh, you can see here on the bottom, this is a material transfer vehicle or a material transfer device. This remixes the uh, hot mix on site, hot mix or warm mix on site. This gets rid of any either physical or thermal segregation. It goes into your uh, asphalt paver through the screed and it's placed out the back. Then you have rollers go over it to compact it. You can have pneumatic and steel wheel rollers with and without vibration. You want to take care of any sort of joints and edges. Um, this is where most deteriorations occur. If you ever want to get me excited, uh, just drive with me on a flexible pavement that has poor longitudinal joints and, and you'll get an earful about it. But also, um, uh, tack and prime coats are important. You put tack coats in between the flexible pavement layers and you can put a prime coat on top of either the aggregate base or the in-place soil if you want a little extra adhesion and water barrier resistance there. And this is all from Asphalt Institute MS22. Again, another excellent, excellent document. Uh, now, once you built the pavement, over time, uh, distresses start forming. So you can see here a huge list of rigid pavement distresses. You have different types of cracking. You have different types of joint deficiencies. You have different types of surface defects. And you have different types of miscellaneous uh, distresses. For flexible pavement, you also have cracking, different types of cracking. You have patching and potholes. You have various surface deformations and surface defects. 
and then also some miscellaneous. Now I could read through all these exact different types of, of stresses. You might start zoning out, you might put me on double speed, I might already be on double speed, but the point is, is there's a lot of information here. I could literally write an entire paving R on any one single type of distress. There's a lot that goes into distresses. So what I encourage you to do is take a look at the Federal Highway Administration Distress Identification Manual. So just Google Distress Identification Manual. You can download it free of charge. That has all of these distresses. It has pictures, levels of severities. It has all sorts of good information about all things pavement distresses. And it's free and it has pictures. What could be better? Now, what do we do to take care of these rigid pavements? Well, you could preserve the rigid pavements, and this is resealing the joints and cracks or retrofitting the edge drains. You could provide functional maintenance to your pavement, which is partial or full depth repair, diamond grinding and grooving, and a thin flexible overlay, or you could prefer, perform structural rehabilitation, which is a retro, uh, retro bar, a retrofit load transfer that is a dowel bar retrofit. You could cross stitch, you could do slap jacking and stabilization, you could remove and replace, or you could place a concrete overlay. Now this is pretty interesting. I got these three definitions, preservation, functional, and structural from that first source, the Texas Transportation Institute Guidelines for Routine Maintenance of Concrete Pavements. Great document, lots of good information in there. I encourage you to download it and take a look. Now, I also encourage you to download and take a look at the National Concrete Pavement Technology Center Concrete Pavement Preservation Guide, third edition. Now, if you look at the third edition, every single one of these treatments listed here is under a preservation strategy. Now, I'm gonna keep my personal opinion out of that, but I think that is a statement that is a basis for an extremely robust discussion. Regardless, I encourage you to take a look at these two sources, to think about these treatments, and to think about how we can classify these treatments. I think that'd be a great exercise. Now, flexible pavements, as I said, I, my background is flexible pavements, and if you go down the rabbit trails, I actually have a very, very deep interest in how we take care of flexible pavements. We can divide them into two different categories. Surface treatments, which is fog seal or rejuvenating fog seal. We have chip seals and scrub seals, slurry seals and microsurfacing and crack fills. For overlays, we have ultra thin bonded wearing courses and standard overlays. And then for structure, we have HIR. To the right here is cold in place recycling, CIR. And we also have full depth reclamation. Now, I could also spend a lot of time talking about these, in fact, I have an entire pavement R on ultra thin bonded wearing courses. No, excuse me, I have an entire pavement R on tack coats. I have an entire pavement R on hot in place recycling. I know that for sure. Um, so all of these could have their own pavement R. But if you want to learn more about these treatments, I would encourage you to go to roadresource.org. Now, this website was put together by industry, and this industry sells asphalt emulsions. So they are extremely interested in you learning about asphalt emulsions. And uh, you need to always be careful of who funded the document you are reading. Now for roadresource.org though, I encourage you to take a look because that is a textbook for flexible pavement maintenance and rehabilitation treatments. And I think that the vast majority of the information on that website is extremely high quality and is not slanted in any sort of unfair way. So I encourage you to take a look at roadresource.org, a phenomenal resource. So we covered a lot of ground here. We talked about a background of flexible and rigid pavements. We talked about material properties and mix design. And then we also talked a little bit about what happens in the field. Now, as I mentioned, a lot of the topics I talked about, I have separate pavement R's for. So I encourage you to scroll through my pavement R's and see if you're interested in any more details. But I appreciate you joining me today, and I hope you have an absolutely wonderful day. Thank you very much.